It's been well said time and time and time again that money is like a microscope. It reveals what is truly going on inside of our hearts. Uh, when it comes to money and how we live for the gospel, we need to understand what place money has in our lives as we are stewards and managers of what God provides for us. Uh, Jesus talked a great deal about money, and in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, he says some words that should be near and dear to our understanding of money. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, nor where thieves break in, and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Uh, Jesus taught over and over and over again that the heart and money go together. Uh, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees was called out on a number of different occasions, and one occasion in particular in the Gospel of Matthew when they were expecting others to give and holding others to burdens to give, but they themselves were not even giving. Our money and our hearts are inextricably intertwined. Uh, we have to ask ourselves questions when it comes to money, like are we eager to meet the needs of others? Are we eager to live generously? Are we content in seasons of little? And are we faithful in seasons of much? Uh, in the Gospels, one out of every 10 on average verses deals with money, and Luke's Gospel leads the way surpassing all of the synoptic Gospels when it comes to dealing with money. Uh, there are several principles about money that I want to share with you today and encourage and challenge you as you weigh how you are stewarding what God has given you with how you live for the Gospel. Uh, the first truth that should come to bear upon our hearts when we look at what the New Testament and especially the Gospel of Luke teaches about money is that followers of Jesus march to a different beat when it comes to money. Uh, we are different than the world with how we handle our finances. Even before Jesus arrived, John the Baptist was announcing his arrival and declaring that followers of the Lamb of God would be called to a renewed way of living and a renewed way of giving. Uh, John the Baptist called for fruits of repentance in Luke 3, verse 8. And when asked, what shall we do in Luke 3, verse 10? He told people to share their food, share their clothing, conduct business with integrity in Luke 3, verses 12 to 13. And if they were in powerful positions to refrain from monetary exploitation. Okay, that is different. If you're going to live for the gospel... It starts with realizing you march to a different beat than the world when it comes to your money. Number two, as believers who are living for the gospel, we guard our hearts against greed. Uh, Luke 8, 14 deals with the parable of the soils. And in one instance, somebody reveals that they are not a true Christian because the thorns, the parasmos in the Greek, is basically the temptations and cares about riches of this world twists them up and pulls them out. Turns out they weren't truly rooted in the vine who is Christ. Uh, greed reveals our hearts. Uh, greed is what caused the young ruler to stumble when Jesus came and said, oh, you keep all the commandments in Luke 18, verses 18 through 25, uh, but there's one more thing you need to do, rich young ruler. Go ahead and sell all you have, uh, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. The Gospel of Luke records that he walked away sad. Uh, he chose his cash over Christ. Why? Because greed had so gripped his heart. Uh, if we're a believer who's living for the gospel, we have to constantly be on guard against greed. It is a snare that has eternal ramifications. Another principle that we can employ is to understand earthly security is not a sign of spiritual security. How many understand that there are so many false teachers out there who will say, oh, give to God and he'll bless you, and that's a sign of his favor. Now, there are some people who give generously, and the Lord, in his provident sovereignty, keeps blessing them with more to be a blessing with more. But nobody in their right biblical mind should ever teach that your wealth is a sign of spiritual favor. There are so many wealthy people on this earth gaining the whole world 
but losing their soul, as Jesus explains in Luke chapter 9, verse 25. Uh, You can have this whole world, uh, but not have the one who holds the world. You can build bigger barns for yourself, but not be storing up treasure in heaven. God himself even said, you fool to a rich man. This very night, your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? In Luke 12, verse 20. Uh, Certainly, wealth is not a sign of high spiritual status. Another key truth, giving money doesn't make up for a lifestyle of disobedience. It can be so tempting to try to give in order to pay penance for your sin. The Pharisees were experts at external religious righteousness, but Jesus explained to them quite clearly that they were corrupt and filthy and even dead inside. You cannot simply outgive your sin. You have to repent of your sin. We can't follow the pattern of the Pharisees and think, well, we'll just look really righteous and we'll give really big offerings and we'll look like we're really sold out for the gospel and God will sort of overlook our lifestyle of habitual sin. It does not work that way. Giving is not your get-out-of-jail-free card when it comes to sin. Another key principle is Something we've already looked at in Matthew 6, but we want to make clear mention of, is where your treasure is, your heart is. Let that sink in. Look at your bank statement. As you look through the way you give, you are going to see what your heart is attached to. For some people, you're going to see date night expenses on there. Well, it means that you probably love your husband or wife and you prioritize date night. For some people, you're going to see sports on there or uh, giving to your church or you're going to see donations to various organizations or maybe you'll see trips with your family. Those are things that God has given you to enjoy. Uh, Paul even tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 there towards the end that God has given us all things to enjoy, but we need to be encouraging the rich not to fix their hope on the things of this world. And so, can your heart be attached to loving your husband or wife? Yes. Uh, Can your heart be attached to uh, creating memories with your family on trips and visiting God's creation around the world on family vacation? Sure, if the Lord has blessed you that way, enjoy those things and use them and do them for the glory of God. But understand that where your treasure is, your heart is. And so over and over and over, allow the Holy Spirit to help you Assess your heart posture through the way you give and what you spend your money on. How many of you understand that it's not ours, it all belongs to him and we're managers? So the idea that it's my money is not in the Bible. The idea that it's my stewardship is in the Bible. And so let's make sure that we are not falling trap to greed and loving our money. Another thing that we need to understand is that big offerings don't necessarily mean big sacrifice. A billionaire could give $10,000 and it's not even going to be a bleep on his or her radar. Uh, Similarly, a broke widow might give $10 and it echoes in the halls of heaven. Uh, Big offerings doesn't mean big sacrifice. It was like that in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus explained the parable and the picture of the widow's might coming and she's putting in her best and the wealthy are arrogantly putting their big gifts in like some big show and Jesus makes it clear she was really sacrificing, they're just putting on a show. And so we can assess our heart and ask the Lord, uh, do I need to be giving more? Are there areas in my life that I should be more sacrificial and more generous with? Uh, Christ's words to the rich in that example in the Gospel of Luke might drop like an anvil of conviction on our hearts. Uh, When he says to all of them as they look on, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they out of all of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. In Luke chapter 21 verses 3 to 4. Big offerings don't necessarily mean big sacrifice. Uh, Finally, a key point is that death is the great equalizer for both the rich and the poor. So we can't for a second think, just because we have a lot, that we're guaranteed a lot. 
A pastor friend of mine once said, there's no U-Haul behind the hearse. You're not going to be able to take it with you to heaven. Death is the great equalizer. We need to be humbled by how finite our lives are when it comes to money. Uh, Jesus was teaching his disciples about money one day when he told the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was but a poor man who ate the crumbs off the rich man's table and lay by his gate, helplessly left in his poverty in Luke 19, verse 21. Eventually, the rich man would die in all his royal robes, and the poor man named Lazarus would die in his rags. One would go to heaven, the other into Hades. From this sobering glimpse of life beyond the grave, we learn that death is the great equalizer. Both the rich and the poor will one day share the same fate. Whether their end is heaven or whether the end is hell depends not on how much money they have, but whether or not Christ has them. Salvation is the key. And so we have to view money in its proper place. On judgment day, it won't matter how much you possessed on earth. Uh, but whom you possessed while on earth. Those who by grace through faith have Christ are going to rejoice abundantly. And we must then remember it is human nature to view money as a false sense of security here on earth. But if we truly have the right perspective on it, we, through our giving and stewardship, can be a powerful tool in the hand of the Lord for the gospel on earth and for his glory in heaven. If you found this teaching helpful and you want to dig deeper, I want to recommend two key resources for you from a friend of our ministry named Randy Alcorn. Uh, the Treasure Principle, Unlocking the Secret of Joyful Giving, is a book that will help you realize the joy of Christian stewardship and generous giving. It's a great book, and the links will be in the show notes here on YouTube. Another key resource for you is Managing God's Money. This is a little more robust about the stewardship of a Christian when it comes to this their money. He talks about debt, savings, retirement, and a host of other practical insights that will greatly help you be a better manager of the resources God has given you. I hope those resources are a blessing to you. Mm -hmm.